Welcome to today's uh, session as part of our series at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Um, the series is called Purpose, Public Purpose in the Time of COVID-19. And this is one of several sessions we've had. And I'm incredibly excited to introduce you to our speakers in just a minute. But first, just to explain a bit more background about what the series is trying to do. What we're trying to do is to really look at the reactions in different countries in terms of thinking about how we actually can build a much stronger and resilient economy. Because what we do in the Institute is we really put purpose and agency at the center of how we think about our uh, economic system. And so how we govern public institutions, how we govern business institutions, and especially how they relate one to another, as well as with civil society institutions that actually determines the kind of market outcomes we get. Um, and so what the series does is it unpacks the current COVID crisis in a way that tries to connect its health, its political, social, and economic aspects with reference to the importance of innovation and public purpose in particular in these dynamics. We also have, just for your information, on the IIPP website, different blogs and also policy briefs that we've been writing um, along the way since the lockdown, partly also as an um, outcome of our uh, work inside particular task forces for COVID-19. That includes work we're doing with the government of South Africa, Italy, also in Camden Council, work that we'll be talking to you about today through uh, Camden's leader, Georgia Gould. Um, and today's session is called Rebuilding from the Bottom Up, the Role of Civic Engagement and Regional Government in Responding to COVID-19. And why I'm so excited about it is it really goes to the heart of, um, again, what we talk about in IPP, because we'll be learning on the ground about the actual experience and how specific public authorities responded. And given that our two leaders who we're speaking to today come from specific localities and regions, we really want to look at what we can learn for the future, for the post-COVID recovery, from the types of experimentation uh, that have been implemented on the ground, what's been learned, especially in terms of driving structures that will be just as relevant, um, really, for confronting the multiple crises that we've been facing in the last decades. Um, and so uh, one of the key things is that uh, I uh, uh, can't speak today. Municipalities, councils, and regional governments play, of course, we know a key role in providing and experimenting tailored policies, rebuilding the socioeconomic fabric from the ground up and stimulating civic engagement. But how civic engagement is actually done for real, as opposed to in a kind of tokenistic way through you know, surveys, that's something that I really believe that our two leaders will be able to uh, speak to us a lot about, which is how do we have a citizen-centered approach both in the short term but also in terms of really engaging society and how we think about how we design um, an economy which I think we all would agree we want to be more inclusive and sustainable. Um, so let me now introduce our speakers. I'll first introduce Ellie Schlein, the Vice President of Emilia Romagna. Ellie's been hailed as a rising star of the Italian uh, left. Uh, she was recently appointed Vice President of Emilia Romagna by President Stefano Bonaccini having played a major role in mobilizing against the far-right push in the 2020 regional election. She's working towards implementation of a Green New Deal agenda in Emilia-Romagna. And previously, she was a member of the European Parliament, where she served on the Committee on Development, the Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Human Affairs, and the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality. These are all different committees that she was working on as a member of the Parliament. Before entering politics, she was involved in both presidential campaigns of Barack Obama, She's also had a long-standing interest in issues surrounding migration and worked on the documentary Anija La Nave, which won the 2013 Davide de Donatello Award. And that documentary tells the story of the mass escape of Albanians to Italy in the 1990s. But welcome, Ellie. Uh, next, Georgia Gould, the leader of Camden, um, the London Borough of Council of Camden and the deputy leader of London Councils. Um, Georgia was elected a labor councillor on Camden Councillor in 2010 at the age of 24 and became leader in 2017. She made tackling injustice and inequality of wealth, income, and influence the focus of the council's work. And she's quite well known actually for the innovative ways that she's been trying to make citizen power and participation a priority in the council. And in fact, the council held the country's first climate emergency citizens assembly in 2019 and has placed restorative, relational, and person-centered practice at the heart of social services. The council is setting up a renewal commission, which we're very proud to be co-hosting 
with Camden Council in the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, uh, which will be recognizing the need for a reset of our socioeconomic settlement in the light of COVID-19. George is Deputy Chair of London Councils and Chair of the Central London Forward Employment and Skills Board and co-chair, this is long, of the Skills for London Task Force and a member of both the London European Structural and Investment Funds Committee and the London Economic Action Partnership Board. And she's also author of a book called Wasted, How Misunderstanding Young Britain Threatens Our Future. So listen, thank, you know, big welcome to both uh, Georgia and Ellie. And as you all know, the amount of funds that are being poured into our economic systems around the world are large. And the real question is, can we make sure to learn from the previous crisis, which required so much money to be injected in, from how that was actually done in a problematic way? So lots of liquidity in the system. A lot of that just ended up back in the financial system. So the big lesson, of course, is that how we structure our, um, our, our responses and also the public institutions and the public sector capacity along the way becomes essential to making sure that that liquidity creation actually solves real problems. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, sort of ask a pretty general question to both of you and, and really try to foster some uh, conversation and then move on to subsequent questions. And as Victoria mentioned to the audience, please do send your questions through the chat, which will then be filtered um, through David, who's on a uh, line here to me, and I will uh, choose the ones that I can address. So first, maybe I'll start with Georgia. I've had the huge pleasure of speaking to you recently um, about what you are doing in Camden. And one of the fascinating things I learned is that, you know, by actually housing homeless people in a hotel, the Britannia Hotel, you did what so many of us talk about is needed but then don't necessarily have the practice, the experience of doing, which is to bring all sorts of different services to the citizen, to the person in need. And I was just wondering if you can reflect on that particular experience, what you've learned from it, and also how you've been thinking through other types of experience like that on lessons for Camden post COVID and how to actually structure the help that it provides to its citizens in ways that your experience on the ground during COVID is, is highlighting for you. Yeah, thanks, Mariana. Um, and it's we're very excited in Camden to be working with you on the renewal commission and to have you as one one of our residents. Um, but but as you say, the 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 kind of whole experience of COVID has has shone a light on existing inequalities, and we had to move quickly to support residents and and our homeless population were were some of the most at risk to, to the disease. So we so we moved really quickly to take over hotels and to create new provision. And what, because we had to move so fast, we, we put all of our services together. So um, we had mental health nurses, substance misuse, um, support workers, employment support, um, all, all of the, the, the kind of care support all in one place. And actually what, what ended up happening was that the, the things that kind of interventions that might've taken years before um, were happening, happening in, in um, weeks. And, and our, the people I spoke to said that their lives were literally saved because they, they discovered health conditions that they'd had for a long time and, and nobody had found before. And so what was a kind of emergency response and, and kind of throw everything up in the air and, and respond quickly actually was a far better service um, for people because it, it met the needs wh where, they, where they are. And I think it, you know, it asks us big questions because you know, homelessness is a huge issue. It's, it's spiraled since austerity started. And we, we, we have everything we need to solve that problem. And, you know, the, the question for us now is, are we going to have the ambition and political will to do that? So, you know, we need to start buying those hotels and putting those services together and, and dealing with some of the fundamental causes of, of homelessness. And, and I think um, that that leads to the, the the more general position, which is this this crisis has shone a light on those those inequalities, whether it's the disproportionate impact on our Black and Asian and minority communities, um, whether it's the way that lockdown has seen some families trapped in severely overcrowded accommodation for for long periods of time, or one of our schools, which is just at the heart of the knowledge district with some world leading companies. One of our primary schools, we found 65% of our children didn't have access to a device to learn or internet access to learn. Um, and so with, with all the scarring impact on their future education. And so 
you know, we've known about these inequalities for, for a long time and we've been working to address them. But I think this is this has just shown how, how stark it is and, and how it is some of our lowest paid workers who are who are on the front line and putting their, their health at risk to, to respond to the crisis. Um, but in a more positive sense, I think the crisis has also shown the capacity and power of local government. So, you know, uh, this has happened around my country and I know from talking to, to Ellie uh, earlier in the week, it, it, it's, it's happened in her community as well. But local government has, has come forward in Camden, we've delivered over 100,000 meals. Um, we've, we've set up um, facilities to, to prevent people with COVID going into care homes. We have put in huge support for our business community. Um, and, and we've managed to respond to the needs of our community. And I think we've managed to do that because of the strength of the relationships we've built over a long time. So, you know, the kind of practice we talk about, citizens' assemblies, real community work has meant that there's trust there. So we heard about the disproportionate impact on um, some of our communities um, before we saw it in the figures, because some of our Somali residents who we've been working with on youth safety were calling and saying, you know, we so many of our community are going into hospital, what's going on here? This is hitting us worse than, the, than other communities. And so we were able to respond really quickly to work with those community leaders who we built real relationships with and get messages out through WhatsApp groups um, in different languages from trusted partners to, to respond. And I think as a result of those relationships, I think we probably saved lives. And that is, that is the power of that community trust um, and, and that's, that's built up for a long, for a long time. So, as we kind of look to the future, I think we need to we need to really think differently because we we as a country in the UK basically propped up the entire economy with the furlough scheme the central government did, and it it shows what's possible if we are if we act um, in in you know in a big way. And so I think that the kind of failure to deal with these underlying inequalities, homelessness, these these long term issues we face is not a failure, you know, it's not a lack of resource, but it's a failure of imagination and political will. And so I think we need to start asking these big questions. Why can't all the value that's created in my community be, be shared with everyone who lives there? How is it unacceptable for 42% of children in my community to grow up in poverty when we're surrounded by wealth? Why are we allowing um, uh, our, our, our society to, to destroy the planet? And, and, and I think that this is the moment to ask those big questions and have a big policy shift. And, and I think that local government um, and local leaders need to be at the heart of driving that change. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's so exciting about Camden, which you alluded to, but for our viewers who maybe don't know, is that Camden is literally sitting on the land that is currently being occupied by some of the richest, you know, big tech companies from Google to Facebook. And so also in terms of the business rates that are being paid back to Camden, you've been really been thinking, I think, in very forward looking ways, issues of, you know, would Camden benefit from setting up, for example, a wealth fund in order to reinvest that, those funds back into the community precisely to drive that kind of important wealth creation that is, you know, focused on, against citizens' needs. Um, but also, I mean, would you, just before I turn to Ellie, would you argue, though, that it actually took this crisis for you to be forced almost to experiment, like with that example that we gave on the hotels that you bought, the Britannia Hotel, brought in homeless people and then designed, because it's a question also of design, designed the different way that the services came to the person in one place, just making it so much easier to access and have kind of a user citizen focused welfare system. Or would you say that you were already kind of experimenting with it before and this is just, I mean, did it actually take the crisis in some ways also to speed up some of your own learnings? I think a bit of both. I think we've been really on a journey to try and put citizens at the heart of of decision making and, and share power, you know, so we've, we've worked, um, you know, in some of the hardest aspects of state power, you know, the take the, the power we do have to, to remove children from their family if we think they're, that they're unsafe in that situation. So we've worked with women um, who are in that position, who've had their children um, removed by Camden Council and we'll work with them to, to redesign services to prevent that happening to other people, really difficult and painful work, which requires um, a, a rebalance in power. So we've we've been thinking about you know uh, re, like having services that shape around that individual and putting that into practice for for a number of years. But I think what this crisis did is it kind of turbocharged that process 
and 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 pushed us to go far, further and faster than we ever would before. So I think we we probably did stuff in three three months that it would have taken years to do otherwise. And and I think what, where it was most powerful is in partnership with others. So you know the kind of negotiations about data agreements and who does this and who does what we by necessity and by by having a common purpose, we were able to, to get through all of those conversations and act quickly together. So whether that's our health partners, um, whether, whether it's the voluntary sector or our communities. And I think the other lesson of this is a way that our communities mobilized in, in just amazing ways. So I talked about the council, but you know, mutual aid groups started before, before we even did. So I think it was the common purpose that, yeah. that made things move much quicker. And, and I think it links to the what you do around missions and actually the clarity of the mission, but also the urgency. And I think we now need to find that same urgency around the climate crisis and tackling inequality. Yeah, great, thanks so much. By the way, if anyone who is not muted in the IFEP team, if you have your email on, we keep hearing an email bing, so turn off your email. <laughs> anyway, Ellie, I'll come to you now. Um, Emilia Romagna, the uh, region of Italy that you're the governor of, is a specific region. And Italy, you know, one of the learnings, I think, in Italy right now can be how its regional reaction and interaction with different actors actually differed. And again, what works, what doesn't. And hopefully there is that discussion right now in Italy. And if you can speak about your own region and how I know just from the previous discussions we've had, you've talked about the specific way that Emilia Romagna reacted in terms also of the public health side, which has its own characteristics because how public health is actually organized in Italy in a decentralized way. If you can just kind of tease out some of the learnings again of um, you know, what happened on the ground and what the lessons are for Italy more broadly, also in terms of interregional learning. Gladly, but uh, let me thank you first of all because I'm, I, I can tell you how happy and excited I am to be here with you, Mariana and, and Georgia, and share some of uh, our ideas and practices and also vision. Um, so, starting from, I mean, just to tell to the people who are following us, uh, yes, Emilia Romagna was unfortunately the second most hit region by the virus in Italy. Uh, so, uh, Immediately, we, we, we started dealing with an, an unprecedented crisis in terms of a health emergency that quickly became a social and economic emergency as well. So we immediately were under a lot of stress to take unprecedented measures to contain the virus and also to reorient all of our instruments of support to the people and the economy. Uh, this crisis is already increasing inequalities, but also creating new needs of people that are entering difficult times only now with this crisis. So in such a world fractured by social inequalities, by economic inequalities, by gender inequalities, for example, it is not true that the virus has hit in a balanced way or in a democratic way. We sometimes hear that argument in the debates. Uh, it can hit anybody, that's true, but the impact it had was very different among different social groups. With this in mind, the first lesson I would say we have to take from this crisis is the fundamental role of the public in general, but in particular of public health. Luckily, we could count on a very strong public health system at the regional level, as you say, here in Italy, the, the, the health system is organized at regional level. Um, and uh, even if we were so much hit by the virus, we have never risked collapsing in terms of reception and care capacity. We managed to very quickly double our places of intensive care, for example, because it was pretty clear that there was a need. Um, and we learned day by day something new on the virus. And this has allowed us also to change on an everyday basis our strategy to contain the virus. And we understood that if we involve the health system at the local level, especially in the peripheric areas and in the mountains, for example, if we could anticipate the treatment before it required to go to the hospital or worse in intensive care, it had an impressive effect in decreasing the number of cases of, uh, of virus, uh, of COVID-19. So this is the first lesson that we can take with us for the future, strengthening the network or healthcare system on the whole region, reducing also territorial inequalities to improve access to healthcare. Because, I mean, the access to healthcare cannot depend on how far is my house 
from a big city like Bologna, where I am right now, you understand? I mean, we have to make sure that also people living in the mountains, so one hour from here, have the same right to access good quality uh, healthcare services. So the same I could say on social policies, because uh, Georgia know, knows very well, social services in many municipalities in the region told us, uh, we were in constant meetings in these weeks and months, have told us that they have seen many people coming and asking for help and support that they have never seen before. So we have put and built together with the municipalities this um, social, regional social fund of 49 million euros with new interventions tailored at the new needs. For example, support to income, to paying bills, uh, on digital divide, for example, for closing the gap for those students who did, who did not have the same access to uh, devices or connectivity to follow the lessons online. So we are, we are trying to reshape all of our instruments, learning every day something uh, on the virus with the objective also not to lose track of those new needs, of those new people asking for help. So if we manage to keep contact with them, we will learn something in terms of the needs of our community how to address them and also how they are changing. So this is something we can really fruitfully take with us of these first months of emergency that were so hard to deal with. Can I ask you a follow-up, Ellie, because that's fascinating. And so from what I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not an expert on the regional differences, but um, I think a region like Lombardia actually has a different structural composition of the public health system. So there's a bit more of the private sector involved and more outsourcing. This is a huge thing in the UK as well. And I think sometimes, you know, when people think about outsourcing and privatization, they think of it as like a big blob, but actually what matters is how it's done. So there's, you know, it's, it'd be fine in theory for the private sector to be involved in a public health system, as long as it's still directed towards very kind of concrete aims that are set by the public authorities. At least that would be my own opinion. How is it, I mean, how does it actually differ between regions and what is your experience in terms of Emilia Romagna's ownership actually of the structures? I mean, was that really important in the end that you were able to move because you, because it was a strong public system with a bit less of that kind of outsourcing and privatization trend compared to say Lombardia? Absolutely, yes. We think it was crucial for us to have this uh, stronger uh, public system. If a health system is unbalanced towards the private sector, then it, you, te you teach me. I mean, it's about a mission. It's a very different mission than one of the public sector and the private sector. And in the beginning of the emergency, it was pretty clear that we needed a strong public response. And so I think that facilitated us. Uh, really in dealing with the uh, with the, the virus quickly and trying to reduce the impact. Uh, also sending out in the homes of people our mobile units of the health system, also to trace uh, the contacts uh, of uh, the people who were positive to the virus. So I think it's very different as an approach and it's one of the things we have to keep in mind. And I say this also to the uh, supporters of, uh, uh, oh, yes, uh, I mean, the health system has a cost. So let's put it in the private sector, uh, sector and we will have, uh, you know, we will spare money for other purposes. Well, there are some purposes, and it was pretty clear with the emergency, that only the public can support. It doesn't mean that you have to get rid yeah. of the whole private. It means that the centrality and the governance has to uh, rely on a strong public governance. Otherwise, in, in such a crisis, it's a complete mess. Yeah. Georgia, can you com come in on that point? Because, I mean, you know more than I do that this is a huge theme in the UK. Um, and in speaking to you, even about kind of other issues, for example, around the youth centers, you once told me that the fact that you actually owned and governed certain youth centers allowed you to experiment and do things that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do even compared to the ones that weren't necessarily privately run, but even the ones run by the voluntary sector. So some, I mean, what are your reflections about this issue of kind of ownership and governance and the kind of publicness of your response? Yeah, I think having real capacity in the public sector is critical. And, and when you see a crisis like this, it shows how important it is. So we, we quite ha quickly had to redeploy staff at speed. So we had librarians and sports staff doing food distribution, for example, and that, and that kind of flexibility um, that you have, if you have that capacity within within the, the state, 
and the and the the re relationships you can build with your community i think is so important so we've been increasingly looking at where where we think it is really important to to have services as we say in house um and 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 looking to bring bring services in house but also looking at the power we have around our own procurement processes so we do we're a huge um a contractor of services there are some things that that um that we do contract and, and we do bring in and we 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 have real power to to shape the labor market to to push private companies to to engage uh, to employ local people to deal with inequality to 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 push up employment practices and and you know we we act as an anchor institution in that way we also act as a leader of place so we uh, you know we've been a living wage borough for you know probably about seven or eight years now probably maybe longer um but because of that we've we've managed to push up the the private sector so so absolutely i think i completely reject the idea that that the private sector is where all the innovation happens i think the state can be just as innovative and and when we really invest in relationships running services ourselves can be really powerful and there's there's examples at the moment where exp we're experimenting um mm -hmm. with older people's uh what we call extra care facilities so where so um uh to support older people with who need supported living and we've gone to um uh to the netherlands we've learned from what they've done there and we're and because we're running it ourselves i think we are able to be more innovative and and more relational than, than we than we would be if the private if we were working for the private sector um but i think you need both i think you need yeah. to 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 be able to run things yourself but also to 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 be able to push to push the private sector through our own procurement Mm. Well, so on that topic of procurement, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that we've been looking at in IPP is how to embed within, you know, the way that governments structure their grants, their loans, and their procurement contracts, certain types of conditions um, that are relational in the sense that they define the relationship between the public and the private sector. And right now, especially um, around the COVID crisis, as I was mentioning before, the huge amounts of uh, public investment coming in in some cases with conditions attached and others not so you know, famously Denmark came up with uh, the wonderful idea of not giving out bailouts to companies that use tax havens or in France the Air France assistance was conditional on Air France actually reducing its carbon emissions uh, whereas here in the UK for example EasyJet was kind of given a free ride here's some money to do what you want no conditions attached can you tell us a bit both of you just how you nest within the immediate kind of short-term help, which of course has to happen immediately, this kind of long-run thinking, a vision for a more sustainable and inclusive economy, whether this be around certain um, conditions on, on tax, I'm just thinking of some of our earlier discussions with Ellie, or around, again, green commitments, especially for both of your, you know, the council and region where you're both talking about the green deal. How has, maybe we'll come to the green bit in a second because I'd like to kind of flesh out the Green Deal during COVID as, a, as my next question. But just first, because you mentioned procurement, can you talk a bit about how you've structured that, maybe both of you, um, to address your long-term vision, given that you're both so visionary, in the immediate? Yeah, sure, Ellie, why don't you begin? Okay, fantastic. Um, well, it's very important that we um, take this opportunity. I mean, uh, you mentioned, Mariana, I have been in the European Parliament for five years. It's quite impressive to see how uh, some of uh, the crucial debates on the future uh, of Europe uh, are, have, have been stuck under dogmatic uh, thoughts for years. And now we see an opportunity to reopen these, these uh, debates, uh, for example, on, uh, on fresh new resources of the Union, on a stronger European budget, on, uh, uh, for example, uh, to take a departure from austerity measures and suspending at the beginning of the crisis the so-called Growth and Stability Pact. Uh, so we, have, we are seeing here an opportunity not to go back to no normal, because that is not an option, but to try to correct normality and also take a chance to rebuild, because we will have to rebuild in our territories, but rebuild on new basis, uh, keeping finally together the social dimension and the environmental dimension it means trying to put together but we will keep it for the next question um, fight to inequalities and ecological transition but let me just mention why is it so important now we've seen new uh, important resources from this recovery fund from uh, I mean uh, 560 uh, billions uh, if I'm not mistaken not billion it's 
yeah, is it right? Uh, trillions, right? Do you say trillion? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Uh, it's a lot of money. It doesn't have to be helicopter money. It has to be oriented towards the future. So it's impressive for me to see the European Commission confirming that these new resources and instruments have to be put on the ecological transition and green deal, uh, the digital transition and transformation, for example, the social dimension. This is very important. I think at the national and regional level, we have to do the same. For example, we try to do the same at the regional level with uh, the, the support on rents. Uh, it was very hard. We, have to, uh, we had to um, uh, completely revise our instrument for supporting on rents. We have put 15 millions that could be used basically in two ways. One is supporting people who had a decrease in income be because of the crisis, obviously, with a proportionate support according to how much your income has been decreased. For example, it's very different if you're a seasonal worker and didn't see any income, or for example, if you had some unemployment scheme and you had 70% of your income by the, uh, by the measures put in place by the government. Uh, so we, we tried to, uh, let's say, put together this, uh, this approach of uh, proportionate support with an uh, innovative measure that incentivates the owners uh, to renegotiate the rents in order to lower them and with a perspective that goes way beyond the emergency. It means that we give an unprecedented support and incentive to uh, owners of houses of, or apartments that decide to lower the income to the people living in their house or apartments by at least 20% for at least six months. But we also so graduate that kind with a conditionality, that kind of, uh, of uh, measure and the maximum incentive, we give it to people who were before giving uh, uh, their homes or apartments to tourists, for example, Airbnb, you know, we want to make sure that these apartments uh, help also families who don't find a, a house. So we give 3,000 up to 3,000 euros to an owner that decides today to make a contract for five years for social housing with a rent of maximum 700 euros. We, we take a difficult moment for both the owner and the person living within that house or apartment, and we make it a new direction for the future after the virus in order also to reduce inequalities and to reduce the cost of rents. And were you able to embed within that also some incentives towards reducing tax evasion given the problem in Italy? And how did you do it? Because of course, also with the tourist industry, that is also one of the large sources of tax evasion. So in terms of giving money to the businesses in order to survive this period, do you think that the post COVID um, moment will be one where businesses also realize that they are damaged if they don't declare their income because otherwise later, if there is another <laughs> uh, pandemic of this sort, they won't be getting the kind of support that they would have wanted because there's no evidence that they ever earned that income in the first place if they were evading tax. Obviously, this kind of support, you can only have it if you have a regular contract. So it is yeah. also at the same time an incentive to go regular. At the same time, we can think about it also with this new important incentive at the national level on energy efficiency. It's a bonus of 100 10%. It means it's even prof profitable to uh, work on energy efficiency of our house, okay? Uh, but the point is, this kind of incentive not only contributes to lower the emission and make it better for the environment, but also uh, it, it's, it's, it's an incentive also there to uh, put regular uh, jobs uh, and, and, and work to do this kind of intervention because otherwise you cannot ask for the incentive and for the bonus. So in a way, we're trying to contribute to the bigger picture. And just to conclude, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm only happy that some countries are going in that direction. We are fighting in Italy to to go in the same direction, it is crucial. Because if you look at the data, for example, the uh, studies of Professor Richard Murphy, you can uh, see that uh, every year in the European Union, we lose hundreds of billions in tax avoidance and evasion of big companies that in the tax savings without palms that we have all around us in the European Union, put our countries in a very stupid position in which they harm each other because in the end, who gains is only the big company who lowers at zero the tax rate, whereas workers are taxed at 
40% or more. This is unsustainable. And at the end, if you end up with 0.05% of tax rate, like we saw in Ireland, well, yeah. you can see easily that if my neighbor does 0.002, well, we end at zero and nobody gains except for the ones who are not paying their fair share of taxes. Yeah, thank you. Georgia, can you also give us some insights on how this issue of conditionalities, which is again, the fact that yes, huge assistance required, but conditional upon helping Camden drive itself towards a greener, more sustainable, more inclusive economy. And feel free to use that towards pivoting now towards what will become the next question around the Green Deal. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the frustrations we, we have in local government here is that our ability to, um, to have discretion over the way we put um, business grants out. So we were given a huge amount of money to flow through to, to businesses, but actually not much discretion to put conditionality on that. And, it, and I think one of the, the missed opportunities already through this crisis is, is the lack of conditionality. And it's one of the things that we're really pushing for as, as part of the economic recovery. Um, but we do have some big levers. I think the, the biggest is our planning system. So we are able to drive um, through uh, council and, and genuinely affordable housing because uh, the average house price in my borough is £850,000, which is way out of, of um, affordability for, for most of our residents. Um, so, so we're able to, to use the planning system and, and uh, as I said earlier, our own procurement powers. Um, and actually that somebody came in on, on the comments and, and I think made a really good point where it's, it's not, there's not a binary choice between the state and the private sector and actually the importance of, of cooperatives, um, uh, mutuals, the voluntary sector um, and, and, and supporting local businesses that have good employment practices are part of what we can do through, through procurement. Um, but I think we do have real power as conveners. So as, as, the, as the kind of local state, we are leaders of place and we are able to, to build coalitions for change. And there are a lot of um, uh, companies that, that do have a strong social purpose and do want to work with us in this way. And we have big institutions like, and, and universities that I think can shape, um, that shape new ways of doing things and bring together a coalition of the willing as we push for more powers. And I think the powers that we'd love to see or, or just a change in how we do business rates, which, which doesn't do anything about um, uh, capturing the wealth, the wealth people get through, through, um, through owning the land um, and, um, and having a way of, of, of taxing some of the big technology giants that we have, you know, on, on my patch. And, you know, so those, you know, there are new, um, new mechanisms we can put in place, but until we do, you know, I think we will, we will use our planning powers. We will use mobilization to, to create wealth funds and to, to create um, new structures. Yeah. Can, can you just give an example for us on how you use planning to create that, you know, given that you couldn't do it with, um, with the business rates, but you know, how did you do it with the uh, um, planning? just in terms of creating the kind of conditions that you thought were useful for the ambitions you had in Camden, besides so, having more social housing, sir. Yeah, so we, um, we've just um, published our climate um, action plan, and in that is a commitment uh, for all building in the borough to be zero carbon, and we can drive that through our, through our planning processes. We also put substantial levies, um, which we called SIL, on development. So, you know, we get money through, through development that we can then reinvest into, into, different, into different models. And, and um, we've talked about universal basic services and so on. So I can talk, yeah. talk all day about that, but, but we have those powers. Okay, so before I bring in the questions, and there's a fantastic list here, just wanted to give you both the opportunity to address this issue of the Green Deal, because I think something you both do that's quite innovative around that is really bring citizens' voices to the table. So, you know, globally, there is talk about the just transition, which is very important, making sure that a transition, tr transition towards a greener economy uh, doesn't penalize, for example, workers working in, uh, you know, fossil fuel-based industries. So we actually invest in them. But often what's not talked about is how to make sure that workers' voices or student voices or basically citizens' voices are at the table ex ante, not just ex post, <laughs> saying, help, make sure I don't get, you know, messed up in the process. So ex ante and even defining you know, green missions themselves at the local and regional level. So if you can talk a bit about whether it's your experience with the Citizen Assembly and whether that experience was really important now during COVID in terms of making sure that how you were also building trust in the community. We know that trust is huge as a, as a feature of being able to properly govern. So just your experience, again, whether it's with Citizen Assemblies or any citizen institution of bringing those voices to how we structure the recovery, but also the plan going forward. So in terms of the Citizens Assembly, we, 
it was definitely one of the most powerful things I've been part of. And we had, you know, it's a genuinely representative group of Camden citizens. And, uh, you know, we're, we're a place with over 130 languages spoken where, you know, where there's huge wealth and huge poverty and people with vastly different life experiences and, and views on the climate crisis. So we had people there who thought that Camden Council should ban all cars yesterday and people who um, thought we persecuted car users. And so that really different voices. And I think what's really powerful about those deliberative processes is they bring people together from those different views to look at the trade-offs, to have deep conversations. And, you know, people, uh, you know, you they get lots of information and evidence about the problems, but they also, you know, get to, to discuss and, and really kind of play out the democratic process in public. Um, and that created a huge amount of energy. And, and after our, our climate crisis, uh, Citizen Assembly concluded, there were 17 recommendations and, and we're taking forward all of them. We opened up a kind of participation space on our high street, a disused um, shop. And that again, was a place really for social action. People came forward with ideas like creating a, a, um, a Camden forest and um, you know our tree team were able to implement that really quickly. So it was a way of kind of linking citizen aspiration to um, uh, to, to the capacity of, of the council. And we worked in a really different way. We, we kind of put down our, our, um, our different roles. So we, you know, and we were kind of finding our way together. And so it, it became, you know, obviously our Extinction Rebellion and our advocacy groups will always push us to, to go further, but we, we started to be in more of a dialogue and, yeah. and, um, and feel our way and test things out and, and, and build trust. Um, in, in how we experiment and, and lead change. And I think as kind of we look forward, I mean, the opportunities for a green-led green, green -led renewal are just enormous. So um, in Camden, uh, we have a huge need to retrofit our properties. So for the, the cheap amount of uh, 800 million pounds, uh, we could retrofit all of our, um, all of our council properties, which would, um, which would create 15,000 jobs. It would um, deal with fuel poverty. Um, and it would get us uh, further than anything else to, to meeting the climate crisis. We can invest in green energy. Um, uh, we, uh, we can uh, create genuine um, high streets, that are civic centers where people can walk and cycle. Um, and so there's a lot of this we can just do as, as a council, but if we had that support from central government, um, you know, the, the opportunities are enormous. Yeah, fantastic. And Eli, can you also um, let us know about how you've, if you want, governed the citizen engagement side of things? And of course, the region that you do govern has a whole history of the cooperative movement itself, I, I think has the highest number of co-ops in Europe. In fact, one of the questions addressed this. Um, so how has that history and experience of cooperatives in Emilia Romagna um, influence how you govern what some call kind of stakeholder governance of a transition and also specifically about the recovery? That's the approach that traditionally was always used in Emilia Romagna to frame policies. And it was very helpful also to cross and, and, and go through this crisis. We never, uh, we've never given up this approach, and not even in the most difficult times. We uh, have a framework that is called the Pact for Work uh, to, uh, that reunites uh, all the different uh, stakeholders, uh, the economic world, the, the trade unions, the university and research institutes, uh, the, uh, uh, the first sector, so-called, of cooperatives and also civil society organization and, uh, and NGOs. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a way that uh, maybe it's more, uh, I mean, it requires more efforts and obviously also time. But in the end, the policies that you, you frame, you are sure are going to be more effective because they are tailored to the needs of the people and then in the communities. What, what I was listening very carefully to what uh, Georgia was saying as well, what, what is happening in Camden, is I, I feel very close to what you're trying to do. So participation of citizens will be crucial. Only in this crisis, more than 10,000 volunteers had helped us alone the institution would have never made it not even in in, in bringing foods and basic needs uh, to the to the citizen or also meds for example that they needed so it's a it's a very strong co cooperation and I agree we don't even need to go in a binary dialogue I mean uh, opposition between the private and the public because if you share in the framework I mean a dialogue you can move to uh, let's say public 
private community partnership that I think we should aim at to, to ensure full participation and also ownership, but also uh, awareness of what you're trying to do together. I always say, uh, we, we are now, to come to your question on the Green Deal, uh, we, we, just, uh, we just won the election in January. It seems a hundred years ago, but it was just four months ago. Uh, what we committed to do, and we are starting to work on it right now, is to integrate the Pact for Work with two very ambitious climate agreement, uh, climate objectives, to go to uh, climate neutrality and uh, uh, going emission zero within 2050, and also to go to, uh, to 100% renewable energies within 2035. If you write them down in a paper that the region can, you know, pull out tomorrow as a, as a I, I don't know, an act or a law without involving all the communities and different parts of societies, you are sure it's, go it's not going to happen because you require that everyone uh, is fully involved to know what's the part that everyone can do in, uh, in trying to uh, reach that goal. So just quickly to, to, to go through the, uh, what we're trying to do, uh, we will... Uh, try to listen to the voice uh, mobilizing for climate, especially the younger voices around Fridays for, uh, uh, Fridays for Future, but also Extinction Rebellion movements, but also the uh, environmental association and to include them in the process to shape this new Pact for Jobs and Climate as well. And so we're trying to, to, to set some of the goals. For example, we have put three million incentives on the bike to work to support people who choose to get a bike or a monopath, you know, I don't remember the, the scooter, right? The, the electric scooter to go to work because we have to pass the message that the car is not the only safe to go to work after COVID. And at the same time, we are supporting with 8 million uh, a measure to make uh, free the public transport for young people uh, um, aging until uh, 14 years old, but then we will try to implement it until 19 years old to, to I mean, to give a concrete signal of uh, what uh, Alex Langer meant when he said the ecological transition will happen when it will be socially desirable. So it's sparing not only emissions, but also uh, money in the pockets of our citizens. So you try to keep this balance together and also work on energy efficiency and obviously on circular economy. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, so I'm going to start reading off these fantastic questions, which I hope someone on the IPP team will save the chat space so we can reflect on the questions also after this, because I doubt we'll be able to answer them all. So one of um, the questions that have come to uh, Georgia is from uh, Marlon Smith, who reflects on how diverse also in terms of income, so how unequal, let's just use the word, uh, Camden is in terms of wealth disparity within the borough, Kentish Town, Primrose Hill. And, and the question is, how did this disparity impact the quality of the service that you were able to offer? And how did you compensate for this massive inequality in such a small area of London? Yeah, I mean, I think it is the big challenge of Camden is, is the depth of our inequalities. And it's, it's what makes Camden amazing is, is our diversity. But it does, it does um, mean that, you know, for some of our young people during the crisis, they had their own bedroom to to sit with their own computer, maybe a tutor, um, and for some uh, living in an overcrowded house with, with maybe six siblings, no access to a device, and it's a completely different experience. So, I mean, I think where we, what, how we try and address that is by, by you know, focusing as much resource and support as possible um, into supporting the capacity of, of those who, who, who face disadvantage. And, you know, what it, as we kind of started to look at the, the issue of food distribution and food um, and access to food, um, right at the start, there were kind of several groups of people. There were those who, some maybe older people who actually have all the money to, to buy food, but actually it was impossible to get a supermarket slot or they were shielding and they couldn't get to a shop. And so they needed support. But then there was, you know, huge issues of food poverty that didn't start with this crisis. They, you know, we've had food banks in Camden for a long time. Um, and and we knew food poverty would only increase, and I think we needed to meet um, to meet both. And so we so we put a lot of work into to making sure that there was access to food for those who couldn't couldn't afford it. Um, so I think everything we do as a council, we have to think about um, those inequalities um, of, of access, but also power, because we really find in, in our place that there are the many people who just know how to use the system. They, they um, are activists, they've got so much energy and that's wonderful, but um, 
if if we only hear those those people we make disjointed decisions and so we so we're always taking time to to bring in uh, underrepresented voices to reach out to people where they are to make sure that they're heard and mm. for me that's the cr critical role of the local state to in, to to ensure that kind of inequality that equality of power I and mean, to do all you can to address some of the inequalities of of opportunity um and housing and access and all those other things but but also power and given how different this is from if one could argue the central government's um view at, at least your real focus on inequality and these new structures that can confront it is there any evidence someone asked and i want to ask this to both of you actually ali and georgia to what degree is central government listening to your local experience? Well, first of all, have you even tried? Like, do you show up in Downing Street or Palazzo Chigi saying, hey, listen to me, I have a great lesson for you. Scale this up to the rest of the country. Um, but, you know, how much listening is there about this kind of regional and local experience that you've both been um, highlighting for us? And in fact, maybe we'll start with Ellie. Do you think there's also a desire from the center to learn from the regions, to then do better in other regions, but also to ask what it means for the nation? It depends on the interlocutor, also at the national level and the, the government level. I can, I cannot. Uh, I mean, uh, I would say in these months of emergency, there was a, a very strong and loyal cooperation with the central government, and there were moments of tension, especially on the need for resources, because regions and also municipalities have uh, uh, had to had to face a, a huge. Um, uh, unexpected expenses, for example, yeah. for, uh, for healthcare, but not only for that. So there was a constant uh, confrontation with the government. I just make an example. When uh, we started discussing at the national level of the so-called second phase in dealing with the emergency, it meant uh, trying to gradually uh, reopen uh, the economic activities and works, uh, workplaces. Uh, there was a void on how to support families in uh, the care of the children, but not only, or even if you have people with disabilities in your house, or also if you have uh, uh, your, your, your mother or your father that you have to, because uh, he's old or ill and you have to take care of him or her. So uh, we, we had to make a very strong point with the government say, you cannot do one thing, one strategy without the other. But we cooperate very quickly to try to present the government with some concrete proposal, for example, for the needs of children and teens and teenagers. And we came out with uh, national guidelines uh, to try to open up some uh, opportunities for education and social activities for uh, people in those uh, in, in, in that age and and this was a concrete example that you can build a strong uh, let's say uh, and, and uh, uh, framework in which the principle of subsidiarity makes the voice of the communities heard at every governance level in order to take the the, 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 the most important decision at the difference level and um, Georgia, how about you? Because I know that there's also been obviously tension with the government in terms of the, if you want, let's just call it what it is, austerity in the last um, uh, decade. So even though a lot of money has been put in now, this kind of increasing talk about burden sharing, no, I mean, it kind of insinuates that soon you'll have to pay the money back. So is there a dialogue also in how to make sure we learn the lessons from austerity? So the fact you were given actually more funds than usual right now to react, how that needs to be kind of a permanent feature of the system versus kind of just during crisis because then you won't have built up the resilience actually in the structures that you need to be funding more continuously. And how do you yeah. communicate that besides? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how to put it politely. I think the kind of the, the government's <laughs> initial response was um, chaotic. Um, that wasn't polite, was it? Uh, like, <laughs> not, I mean, they, the issue what the issue was trying to centralize and run central schemes rather than trusting local leaders and communities mm. to, to do things so whether it was distribution of PPE or or food um, the 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 central the central schemes just just didn't kind of fit the needs of our community so so we'd already kind of uh, were distributing um, PPE uh, well before we started to, to get anything from central government and, and food and we continue to throughout because we have a diverse community and the, and the, the food that was coming through from central government didn't meet the needs of, needs of our community for example and 
and that we, we, we had the relationships with our voluntary sector to be able to, to, to understand where the need, need was and, and to build a kind of wraparound support around food. So as I think Ellie was saying, it's not just food, it's prescriptions, it's mental health isolation, it's, 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 it's everything that sits around it. So we have been pushing this really hard and um, over test and trace, the government initially went with a very centralized system, but about a month ago, that started to shift and Camden stepped up to be one of 11 uh, local authorities that, that took the lead in trying to support the government to, uh, around test and trace. And I sit on a national advisory committee and, you know, fundamentally, this is, we all want the same thing. This is about the safety, um, uh, you know, of our community and fundamentally about trying to save lives. And if, if there's anything we can do to make it work and to, to, to make it meet the needs of, of our residents, uh, of course, I will try and do that. And so, so I, I, you know, I go to a meeting every week, I'm very involved in, in, in trying to, to shift that, that practice to empowering local government and supporting local government. But I think, and there's still a long way to go. So we, even though we got a bit of money, we've still got an 83 million gap so we um we've uh, we've had 19 million um from government and the cost of all of this is going to be um uh is is going to be 83 million so so uh it's going to be uh, the gap is 83 million between between the 19 million so and i think nationally it's 10 billion for, for local government so fundamentally austerity is still happening so even though we heard from boris the weekend that austerity was over and there were some press ups we there's there's a 10 million hole just for the crisis that's before you look at um all of the austerity over the last 10 years so we lost half our budget over over the last 10 years so I, there's a long way to go before that becomes anything more than rhetoric um so i you know i, I really it's interesting of course is, yeah and i mean camden's been leading in many ways with this kind of notion of an outcomes oriented budget now that you first ask what's to be done and then you you know think about the money as opposed to given a, a, a limited amount of money what can be done so I think you, your voice on this would be extremely useful nationally. Um, so two questions have come in that are very similar, so I'll just join them up. Um, and it's uh, you know, really to both of you on how do you choose organizations to be part of your kind of citizen engagement? So specifically the question is, how are your citizen assemblies structured? But in Emilia Romagna, if you're not calling them citizen assemblies, your citizen engagement, who is identified as community leaders? How do you make sure that you really do get that representation? And if you guess, can give us some tips on the kinds of questions you use to help diverse participants engage in deep and meaningful discussions, as opposed to a box ticking diversity exercise. So we have what we call community researchers who are members of, um, who are kind of from very diverse backgrounds and we employ them to to, to go out and to lead research from us. So they're, they're, they might be um, uh, from, from across the borough, different lived experience. And um, they, they actually recruit for us. So they knock on doors, um, they, they go to where people are and they, and they uh, and kind of ask people to join. And then we, we have a kind of criteria of what is the diversity of a borough. So in terms of tenancy, age, um, ethnicity, um, all, all the different kind of aspects of of, um, of the kind of profile of our borough, and we and we kind of slot people in randomly from the the wider pool to to meet that to meet that criteria. So it's very much going out into the the community, and we we give people um, a voucher for taking part, and I think that's really critical because I remember the first citizens of the assembly we did. There was a young guy that got up, and he was like. I only turned up for this voucher, but it, this is the best <laughs> thing I've ever been part of. And you want that. You don't just want the people like me who are very weird and would love to spend an evening in a kind of cold hall discussing <laughs> local community. Um, but you want people who would never usually turn up, but actually have a huge amount to contribute. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so, so we, we have, um, we, we always have an independent organization who runs them um, and a kind of panel of experts who help um, decide who the speakers are. Um, so we, we try and ensure that, you know, it, it is people who would not usually take part in, mm -hmm. in decisions, but it, but that's not the only thing we do. There's lots of different kind of um, engagement. We sit around it, but, but yeah. for the formal citizen assembly. And how about you, Ellie? How, how is this done in the region in terms of making sure you're really capturing different voices at the table? Obviously, I'm not very good in selecting. I'm, I'm very inclusive. <laughs> Just to make you an example, in order to make these proposals on the activities of young people during the summer, uh, we created a, a table with 70 
people who are representing different experience in, uh, in the schools, uh, in the territories, but also uh, pedagogic experts from universities. So it was, I mean, I, 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 I like big frameworks and inclusive frameworks, but let me say, uh, we engage with the association or communities to, uh, and, and, and we ask them to organize themselves and to select and choose their representation. I mean, we, we cannot decide for them who better represents them. So this tradition of Emilia Romagna in creating a framework of stakeholder governance be, among its positive effects has also this part. I mean, we, uh, because association and organization want to jump in the framework and to participate and to be asked by the region what to do and how we can work together closely and cooperate on, on, on a mission or an, on an objective, uh, we, that's where the region asks to these organizations or, or associations or cooperatives, for example, to democratically uh, coordinate and find their representation, a spokesperson, uh, I mean, and, and the pact for work reunites the bigger uh, and most representative trade unions, uh, uh, association of entrepreneurs, but also university, and of course, the municipalities. You cannot hear at the same time the 328 municipalities of the whole region, but they have their association, ANCHI, that comes to the table and then you also reunite some of the mayors of the bigger cities and also the provinces, so that you are not, uh, let's say, unbalanced between big cities and smaller yeah. communities. And one follow-up question from Rafael Garcia Achevez says, do you envision mechanisms to engage citizens also in the monitoring? So in relation to how government actually contracts. So specifically, he says, can citizens help to monitor that contractors actually deliver adequately the goods and services needed to address the pandemic? What do you think, Ellie? And then I'll ask Absolutely, you. yes. Just before coming here for this wonderful debate, I was together with President Bonaccini meeting the, uh, let's say, uh, coordination of the association of people and families with dis disabilities. And that's exactly, they, they were, for example, they said, uh, you region, you have done a protocol to reopen some of the places where uh, 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 disabled people can uh, access services, okay? But even if you have done that piece of paper, in some territories, these places have not reopened at all. And I, and I told them, you can be very precious in monitoring. I mean, let's put together our knowledge. I have some data. I have, I mean, the monitoring that the region is doing by asking the health system in the territory. And at the same time, I need your feedback because it will be a, a better and, and comprehensive picture of what's going on. So yes, it's yeah. one of the ways in which we have to go. Georgia, do you guys get feedback on where you're messing up compared to where you're doing really well? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you mentioned, one of the um, one of the recommendations of our Climate Citizens Assembly was a standing panel of citizens who would monitor our progress because you know there there is a question. You know, we've said we'll we'll implement these 17 recommendations, and and that you know they've given up their time, and so they 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 were like, we want some certainty that this is actually going to happen, and that we want to be able yeah. to push these. So we are. We're setting that up, but but I think kind of really powerfully we 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 are uh, we have a big council house building program, and as part of that we employ local people to to lead on that development. So that's designing the homes and um uh, and working with their their wider community. We we have a ballot before we we go ahead with any with any program, but um they they do exactly that. They hold the private contractors to account, and so when I go and visit um, homes with they, they, they'll go around and show me the fittings and this is there because we wanted it to be there and this is yeah. this, this is how it, it should have been done and this is you know and and they are and they're advocates and we're looking at something similar around other big kind of housing projects so, mm. so absolutely I think citizen voice needs to be embedded into um, into the procurement process itself into choosing um, into choosing uh, wh whoever it is um, to run services and then to, to, to monitoring. And, and I think as we start to think about shaping the local economy, actually who comes into, into that community, um, you know, through, through that, that process, is, is that company one that's committed to the, the, the aims of that neighborhood and wants to give, to give? So that's something we're talking to mm. private developers about. And do you both find that the, the, I mean, how do you, so, so in fact, one of the questions is kind of pushing this even further. How do you 
and make sure that you're actually investing in citizens' capabilities to participate. Because one thing is just to say, okay, everyone, come and tell us your ideas. Another thing is actually to really embark in the investment in the capabilities of the very people who might not due to historic, whether it's education or as you were saying, confidence or in some cases skills, um, be able to engage in the process. So do you take kind of a, um, you know, a, a capability investment approach that's different from the kind of subsidy approach um, when you're thinking about engaging citizens? And can you give us an example of where you've invested in that capability building? That was a question by Nives de la Valle. So promoting people's capacities and skills to be part, for example, of the green transition requires investing in their own um, capacity. Awareness. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's very important. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, the capability approach is one, I mean, one of the, the objectives that we are trying to, to pursue, for example, by uh, supporting participatory processes in some of the cities where they're trying to involve citizenship also in uh, writing down a part of the balance, uh, the budget of the, of the city, or, uh, for example, by um, uh, fostering opportunities of, uh, um, uh, how do you say, uh, training of people on the agenda of 2030 and the 17 sustainable development goals. Because, for example, last week we came out with a program of support on uh, European citizenship. Uh, the aim of the projects that can be uh, presented by both municipalities or association uh, is to, um, let's say, strengthen the knowledge of the institutions and the uh, participation of the of the region in, in a bottom-up process. I mean, both in writing uh, European legislation, but also in implementing European legislation, and also knowing better what are the opportunities. I mean, the region can actually support these kind of projects that require participation in a, a, a view of uh, um, not only subsidy, but also increasing the capacity, empowerment, and also um, giving value to the uh, competences of our citizens. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Georgia, just in the sake of time, I want to, I'd prefer, instead of having you both answer the same question, move on. And, and so there's one that's related actually to the tech companies that you were mentioning. And, and by the way, next week's COVID series for IFP is specifically on that. It's on July uh, 6 at 4.30 to 6 p.m. It's called Digital Divide and the Platform Monopolies During COVID-19. And we'll have both Francesca Bria, president of the Italian Innovation Fund, but also with the big uh, experience in actually governing digital platforms in terms of her advice on that globally and Giulio Poggiotto from UNDP. Um, so, so the question from Kirsten Van Stronsen is, for Georgia, that you seem to point to a kind of circular solidarity, but how do you make sure that the bigger tech companies that are currently located in Camden, Google, Facebook, um, actually work in real partnership with citizens and the local government for the long term, as opposed to just kind of a one-off to make themselves look good and then see you later? <laughs> I mean, that is, that is our big challenge. I mean, I think that the, the, what I'm always saying to, to them is, you know, you, you're, um, you're part of our community. You're a neighbor um, as, as much as, as any of our residents. And fundamentally, people are attracted to, to King's Cross, where a lot of kind of tech companies come because of its energy, its creativity, its diversity. And that's, that comes from our citizens, that comes from our communities, it's our kind of creativity, our music, our, mm -hmm. our culture, our radical history, that, that's what makes Camden great. And what the issue is, if by being there, you push out all of, all of, all of the um, uh, diversity from, from that place, like, like we've seen in, in um, Silicon Valley. So, so, we are, so it's absolutely something we're pushing. It's actually funny, this morning I we we did a session with google where they had um we've been we've been doing virtual work experience so they've taken 100 young people um from camden on virtual work experience this week and it and and our young people are so excited to to be in there to be kind of connecting and part of it so we you know we are we are progressing we have we did we have something called the the steam hub so it's um we ran a big steam commission we invited all of our big tech companies and creative companies to to be part of it um, and we we asked all of them to sign up to a pledge, so they so their staff are um, uh, become kind of steam ambassadors in our school. Uh, it's all about making sure that those buildings aren't just kind of glass places they walk past on the way to school, but you know places that they that they can aspire to to be part of and that they can that they can get good well paid jobs in. And that has been really successful. And we we have a hub within our schools, so we have a family of schools 
um, in Camden that all work together. And there is there are real relationships that are built. And so for me, I think that the critical thing is actually the relationships between staff and and other institutions, because effectively, lots of people who work in those places want to give back, want to be part of a community. And actually, once you kind of get into the heart of an organisation, things can can um, uh, you can you can create real change just by bringing more and more people into into working with a community. So I think you can do a lot uh, as a convener, but I think some of the kind of tougher and bigger issues about you know money for council homes and so on, um, you know, which is about affordability um, uh, re require a, a kind of bigger transfer of, of resources and, and, and more of a push. Great, thanks. Um, Ellie, a question for you that goes back to the issue we were talking about before about learning between regions. So Madalena Bayer Giraldi asks, how much are the strategies that you're adopting being shared among other Italian regions, specifically those led by Lega type governments, um, like in the Friuli Venezia Giulia? Is there a willingness to listen or is it really kind of a political divide? Has COVID reduced the political divide, the ideology and really fostered a willingness and a thirst to share what works, what doesn't? To some extent, I would mention what Georgia was saying before in the difficult connection, I mean, in, uh, discussion with the, with the national government there. Um, we, through the crisis, we had to, I mean, show uh, national unity, work together very closely with all the regions, and obviously also the, the differences that are there, uh, you, you could see them less than usual, but still there are those differences in the approach, in this attention that we have, at least in this region, that always in the difficult times after the war, after the earthquake uh, some years ago, uh, we always tried to rebuild, taking in mind that the, I mean, the whole community cannot um, get up if you don't have an obsession to try to help the ones who are lagging behind. And so the point is how to have an inclusive uh, growth and recovery. Um, so of course, this is not the approach that uh, probably uh, all the other regions uh, will have. What happened through the crisis is also thanks to the fact that our president Bonaccini is also the president of the conference of the, of the regions. Uh, it's it's uh, an institution that has a constant dialogue with the government. So we had also to try to uh, come together with the other regions, define similar strategies or proposal to then share with the government. So for us, it's always difficult to find a balance between, and, and, and President Bonaccini very often has to find a compromise between the different regions and the different also approaches of the different political parties that are leading the 20 regions of the country. So. It's, be, it's been hard, but I have to say, still you can see the difference if you look very well. Great, thanks. So we're closing in on the time. So this is a nice uh, big uh, fat question, which will also be related to my last question to you both, which is to give us at least one statement of hope. <laughs> but the question just to throw us back into a bit of depression is from Jacob Mulugeta, who's actually from UCL. He says, we can recall the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, when there was a real buzz around a green recovery but that didn't materialize. So what makes us actually think and believe that the conditions this time are any different? Um, and why should we be able to, or think that we can expect a better outcome? Is there really a shift in the public and policy domains to imagine a green recovery? You know, we did a survey of our community um, just earlier before this all started and the climate crisis was the number one issue for them. And that's never happened before. Um, you know, it's always been safety or crime or housing and, you know, Camden is a, it's an urban centre, you know, so it, you know, that won't be true of, of everywhere in the country, but, but, but that, it, the, the kind of public mobilisation, I think we've seen and the kind of understanding of it um, has really changed. And, and in air quality, I think you really see that, especially in cities, you know, people are really fed up of poor air and worried about their children's health. And we have so many more older people getting asthma and you, you, they see the negative impact of of um of what we're doing to to our planet so so i think that, that there has been that change and and i do think you know we we have a conservative government who who is talking about climate the climate crisis in a way that i i don't think we would have ever seen um previously so there does feel like there's a kind of cross-party commitment but 
you know, it, we could absolutely squander this moment. There's, you know, it, we could end up with a car-led recovery. We could go for um, recovering the economy as project. it is. Shop, yeah, yeah, you know, um, uh, you know, just pouring money into to consumption. Yeah, I mean, we could absolutely miss this moment. And so I think that, that what can stop that is, uh, you know, is a movement, is a movement of local authorities, of people, of civil society that says we cannot do this. The, the public health crisis of the climate crisis is just as big as COVID. This is just as much of an existential threat. And, and we have to show the, the same um, drastic measures and the same imagination that, that, we, that we do in response to the climate crisis um, as, as, as we did to that public health crisis. Mm -hmm. Ellie? I am very hopeful and, and I'm hopeful also, I, I'm not kidding after a debate like this. I mean, I can connect with Georgia, even if we've never met before. I mean, we, we just had a talk a couple of days ago in, uh, before this meeting, but, uh, but I'm sure that, to, I mean, tomorrow we will be fighting the same fight. And when I hear problems and the problems of a community, I can connect with the problems of my community. So the point here, we have witnessed it for years, the creation of an international of nationalists. They are getting stronger and stronger with the same rhetoric of hatred and intolerance. And it's a paradox, complete paradox, because, I mean, Orban gets stronger with Salvini and Le Pen, even if uh, ultimately, I mean, the rhetoric would put them enemies, be, 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 I mean, at the opposite front of the same wall they're trying to build, and they're actually building in some cases, unfortunately. But the point is, where are we? Where, where are we? I mean, where is the point of the progressive and environmentalists that think the same thoughts and that fight the same fights at the European level? the national level. I mean, and this goes beyond Brexit, let me say. I mean, we are facing challenges on which the national dimension will not be sufficient anymore. The more we will be able, like the, uh, the, the, the Greta Thunberg and Fridays for Fu uh, Fu Future have shown us, why has managed, why that mobilization has managed to actually put in the center of the uh, agenda in many countries, the climate change more than what we did, because let me, uh, let me be honest, a couple of ways, uh, years ago in the European Parliament, it was a few of us talking about the Green New Deal. I would have never expected to see it in the program of the government at the Italian level and to see the Green Deal at the European level. So it's a step in advance. Of course, it will require all our effort to make sure it becomes real but in order to become real let's learn something from this movement also the movement for gender equality and the polish women protesting for their rights that we have never le uh, left alone that made that protest stronger so the more we will be able to connect transnationally our fights for the same public goods the more we will be stronger i'm sure so this is what me makes me really hopeful it, it, will, it will require some time but we are going in the right direction i hope Great, thanks. That, that really comes to the center of one of the things we foster in the Institute, which is learning between uh, global public organizations. And I think what you're saying is that there's kind of also easier way for that communication to be happening now in lockdown. We're all kind of Zooming in, in your own experience and speaking to Georgia. But one of the things that we try to do is kind of steward that in such a way that it's a real learning also of the challenges and opportunities that were faced precisely when organizations or policymakers step outside this narrow box that they've been told they can occupy, which is to fix markets and then get the hell out of the way, you're gonna crowd out business. And we foster that learning between, you know, from organizations like the BBC to a public bank in Brazil, to uh, you know, citizens, um, sorry, a digital agency like the one I mentioned in Barcelona. So one of the questions I have for you, um, because what we try to do is also link how practice on the ground has been informed by theories about the state, theories about the public sector, or the absence of theories around issues like public value and public purpose, if you were going to give kind of some insights to also academia, or if you want thought leaders who are trying to rethink the state precisely to get better partnerships between the public sector, the private sector, and the third sector, where have you seen the big gaps in the framings? And, and where would you like to see kind of the, the you know, the theory informing the practice, which then I should say the practice tends to also come back in and inform the theory. And that's one of the things we really believe in. But where do you see the big gaps? Like where would you love us to be, um, you know, doing some more field work and, and theory work so that your own work can be strengthened? 
Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I should have warned you about that one. Very big one. Georgia, do you have any <laughs> quick <Answer>. thoughts? <laughs> no, no, she's keeping me in the hot spot. Okay, so uh, I think that, um, I mean, you're doing already a very useful job. Uh, your thoughts, uh, Mariana, even before I get to know you, you uh, were leading uh, our, our vision, for example, on uh, the capacity of states of uh, innovating, because there are a lot of uh, prejudices on this. On this. Okay. It depends on a lot of factors. For example, also, let me say, how we can innovate our public administration. Obviously, it is getting older and older. I cannot expect maybe the willingness to also innovate and, and rethink completely our instruments and methods of work uh, if we don't innovate also uh, the people sitting in the institution and the public administration. So it's also generational yeah. that, that they see very strongly. But it's, uh, it's, it's about listening and dialogue and another prejudice that usually politicians have that uh, if you do participatory work, you lose useful time. It's not the case. Yeah. I mean, the decision, that, as, as I said before, the decision that comes out of that will be stronger. So on, on what side you can help? Well, this is the big point. I'm, I'm asking myself what we can do. Uh, innovation processes have uh, made our lives and, and, pro and, and, uh, and uh, production better, obviously. But uh, it's obvious that they have not... Uh, reduced inequalities, they have increased inequalities. So they are producing um, a bigger concentration of data, knowledge and uh, wealth, okay? How do we revert this process? Mm -hmm. How do we revert not going back in the 50s and not using uh, our technologies, okay? So this is a, a point in which we, we need your help also in how to put the right conditionalities, for, the, uh, for example, at the, all, the, all the different levels, but to engage, like Georgia told us, with Google. Google is not my enemy. I mean, I'm happy that people are doing profits. We need that as well. But we also need ways to redistribute that wealth. Otherwise, we will not have sustainable basis for the future on this. I mean, some help from your side, from the, uh, from the academy in, mm -hmm. in, in general, it's, it's, uh, it's must and very much needed. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways we frame that is in terms of kind of pre-distribution, right? Getting new structures that already embed that equality rather than kind of creating this wealth creation process that creates massive inequities that then you have to come in to redistribute. How do you kind of think about distribution ex ante, not just yeah. ex post in terms of the structure of the relationships, very much at the center actually, George, of how you always talk that relational aspect. But do you want to give us some uh, ideas of where? Yeah. I mean, obviously academia... everything Ali said, I was going to say, but, <laughs> um, but I mean, I think that, you know, there's things that we intrinsically see, right, is that, when we um, invest in relationships, when, when we give people more power over their own lives and communities, it, it completely changes lives. And I, I see it in every part of my work. But sometimes, you know, we, we, don't, we can't prove that investment. So when we're going into conversations with, with central government about where money should go, we lose the argument about uh, investing in social infrastructure, investing in empowerment, investing in in, in what we talk about as early help, but investing in the strengths of, uh, of people and communities and the capacity of, of people and communities. So, so, so help in, in demonstrating that this, this work isn't only the right thing to do, but actually it saves money in the long term. And, and so we can make that the case to people who, who, don't, who you know, have different things that, that drive their, their policy agenda, I think is really important. And, and I think the second thing is, you know, we are starting to think about you know, we're trying to imagine a future that doesn't exist, one, one that, that, that has that ju just transition, which really um, challenges those inequalities, and that the institutions we have won't get us there. So I think we need to create new institutions. And Mariana, you, we've talked about some of what that might look like, the, the kind of community wealth fund, universe, universal basic services. But, you know, that, that I think that you know, what, how do citizens really have a stake in their local economy and all of the structures we've done so far and uh, about kind of redistributing the proceeds of growth haven't got us there. And I think that's why your work around, around value is, is so important and, and why we're so excited to have you working with us right. in, in Camden. But I think what yeah. are those, what are those um, new institutions and how can we make them, how can we create them? Yeah. 
I actually have a piece in tomorrow's New York Times around this where I, I argue that the kind of narrative behind universal basic income, which I definitely support, but the narrative is still the old one of a handout, whereas even just framing it, the same program in some ways, but as a, as a citizen's share, a citizen's dividend, it's already a different framing, right? It's we are collectively creating wealth. You want your share of that wealth versus this idea that you're just going to be sent a check by central mm -hmm. government. And, you know, this is why also the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, I think, love UBI because it doesn't actually debunk where that wealth creation process is coming from. Anyway, unfortunately, we are literally come to an end. And I can just say that we are thrilled in IPP to be working with both of your teams. We're working on the mission-oriented approach in Emilia Romagna and, of course, with the Camden uh, Renewal Commission. Thank you so much. And I hope that you, too, now are friends and can continue this offline and have virtual drinks. <laughs> um, but thank you to all of you who also attended this. We began with close to um, 300, and I think people are now moving on to their uh, gin and tonics or feeding their kids. Um, and just, again, thank you, everyone. And do remember, please, that next week, July 6th, 430, we have exactly the theme that uh, Ellie was talking about, this issue of how do we actually govern platform capitalism and the digital divide. And we also are very lucky to have just received a large um, grant from the Amidyar Foundation around actually mapping digital rents and how can we govern that process to pre precisely do what Ellie was talking about, which is to reinvest, <laughs> recreate, and invest in the capacities of communities um, around digital as opposed to it just producing profits. Anyway, so thank you everyone.